So is there a simple solution? You know, there are no simple solutions, and certainly not the ones that Ken and I are talking about it. But a carbon tax would go a very long way to help us. So anyway, that's sort of why you know, our crew sort of works on this. And I'm going to talk a little about the history of engineering. We actually did accidentally engineer. We've been doing it for 200 years. And so the Nobel Prize winner for chemistry, Arrhenius, you know, was well aware of this, that it's going to happen. In fact, he calculated. If you double the CO2, you're going to be between two, two to four degrees C of temperature rise. And that's sort of what we think it is. He couldn't deal with the clouds and all that kind of stuff. So this being talk about this, but the real stuff started when Paul Crutzen, who was a Nobel Prize winner, uh, uh, you know, atmospheric scientist for the ozone hole, wrote a paper. And this went to the editor and other people said, Paul, you can't write this paper because this is really the end of the world. We're now going to start messing with this wacky idea. So what I actually did is they published two papers with one on Paul's and then the other so that everybody had a say about this. And the word was, we should never even consider that. So now, 10 years later, what used to be an off-the-wall walkie idea is now endorsed by the National Academy of Sciences. Very cautiously, they've said, look, we don't like it. None of us like it. We have to start looking into geoengineering research. You know, when we do this, we got to realize that our past efforts at changing even the weather, okay, are not a great success. In fact, even rainmaking, according to the National Academy, is just very scant evidence that it works. And so there is no reason for overconfidence in anything that we're going to do. So by far, the safest form would be the CO2, set the CO2 back. Now, so you're talking about four molecules per 10,000. So you can move huge amounts of, of uh, you know, air and all that kind of stuff. It's, you need a lot of energy to do that. And so we don't know yet very well how to do that. But people are working on it. So what we do over here is we take a little bit of this, this incoming sunlight and we try to reflect that. Well, Ken has talked about that. I don't need to tell anyone. So this is the first geoengineering report. You know, it wasn't, this is in 1967. No sweat. I mean, this, everybody say, yeah, that's what we've got to do. Now, when they're actually there, it's very controversial. So what we might do for us, you can see here three different scenarios. That's the, uh, the putting the stratosphere in the thing. So you, you can cool it, and then you come back. Once you get doing it, you have to do it until you know what's going to happen. You have to. What this does, at the very best, is bias time. Okay. But we know that you know, humans, when they're squeezed for time, they do very well. Just look at the World War, right? During World War II, we invent 10 times faster, usually, than we do in a regular. We in five years, we did, but we in 50 years. And so that, that's really saving grace of this. Once you start and you stop it, the temperature is going to rise very rapidly. And that's very bad. That doesn't mean necessarily you have to do it. And so there are, there are better ways than what is described here. So there are two viable ways. Ken has talked about that. So what we do is we spray ultra-fine seawater droplets at sea level. And these drift into the clouds. The clouds get denser and wider. And this, you know, this, this thing is gone after about a week, so I keep on doing it. And so it's very localized. You can do this on a small scale. And the two methods actually may be used together. So the stratosphoric sulfur, you know, this technology is quite feasible. It's eminently doable. It's probably going to work. The public doesn't like it because they say, you know, ooh, acid rain. Well, of course, the amount of sulfur that you put up there to do that is a very small fraction of what we put to the chimneys of our coal plants. It's difficult to do on a small scale. You know, it's, just, it's very difficult to do. You can put a certain amount in before you can see it. And it can't do it done in a short time. That's Vague rumors that you know, each time the volcanoes go off, we see uh, something happens to the ozone layer. But of course, you know, that could be coincidence. So that needs to be investigated. And then it's going to have some unusual effects. Remember, Mount Pinatuba had this beautiful sunrise, et cetera. But it has, you know, the sky will never sort of look completely white anymore, blue anymore. So marine cloud brightening was conceived by John Latham, an English atmospheric scientist, when he was walking with his son in, uh, you know, in Wales. And, they come above the clouds, and the sun said, hey, look at those clouds. You know, it's like a mirror. It can reflect sunlight. So that gave him an idea. And so 25% of the ocean is covered with marine boundary clouds. So when you go to the coast here, that's what you have. These clouds aren't very white, and that's because they don't have very many droplets in it. You know, it's sort of like milk. It's white. There's nothing white in milk. It's just uh, little fat balls and water, OK? And it's the same in clouds. It's just tiny little droplets of water and thing. But overall, it, it gives you a white 
reflectance, and it becomes gray when there aren't enough droplets, just like when you thin a glass of milk. So if you can increase the cloud density and the self by about 6%, then you could change the reflectivity by 1%. So that's quite significant, essentially. It can quite offset the temperature effects of doubling CO2, but none of these matters does anything about you know, acidification of the ocean, which is something that Ken is working on now. So it's conceptually simple and environmentally benign, but none of this is really, uh, I mean, it, th there are bad consequences to all of this. So the clouds consist of droplets about 10 micron. You put more of them in it, and essentially the clouds become whiter. So this is what happened. You had these big droplets, and you put some more in it. They suck out the moisture, distribute. The clouds get much whiter. And you can see this over here. You put more droplets in it. So you can go easily get 5 or 6% change in the reflectivity of these clouds. Will this work? Well, this is the shipwrecks already do this on occasion. And you see shipwrecks over here. And the reason they do that, they don't spray seawater, but they burn bunker oil, which is a very, uh, you know, it's got a lot of sulfur in it. And so that actually creates this, the sulfate is a very good nucleus for these clouds. So likely some of it will work. So they've been talking about for 20 years about this, and then the unresolved crucial problem is can this spray be made? So there was an Edmund conference and, uh, by Pfizer, which is a Gates Fund for uh, initiative in Innovative Climate and Energy Research, and Ken and, and David Keat are sort of a guidance of that. So I was asked to start an effort here in Silicon Valley. And so we started in the spring of 2009. So what we want to do is to make a sprayer that makes uh, very small particles of seawater. And so you know, we take about a half a glass, a half a wine glass, and you make 10 to the 15 particles out of that. That's sort of the given that you would like to do. So you make nuclei, cloud nuclei, of about 80 nanometers, 50 to 80 nanometers. That's about 1,000 the diameter of your hair. Yeah? So hair varies from 50 to 150 micron. This is, this is from 1,000 times smaller. So it doesn't, you know, it's so it got to be very robust and simple because you try it in the field. So where we are now is we sort of identify three models, one very promising. We don't have a corporate structure. This is just a scientific experiment. We uh, started with 12 volunteers and, you know, it's sort of a mostly geriatric crew. There are five left over. I, I shouldn't speak for Gary, but one guy, he comes in every morning. He's close to 80 and says, my brain is going. So we ask him, Jack, what's your name? He says, Jack. And then, you know, lift your left hand, lift your right hand. And he's good for another day's of work. So, <laughs> So, you know, this, this is how it goes. And so, so we're connected to a, an international group of 12 atmospheric scientists, you know, that tell us sort of what to do. And the University of Washington is now taking over the project. You know, in, in the process, we've had enormous goodwill for all that kind of stuff. So I have a friend that doesn't believe in global warming, at least not that it's man-made. I don't think he's here in the audience. He, but, you know, he gives us all our facilities. So we go drill, drill holes there in diamond. I traded two... Um, Two plates of diamond, industrial diamond, for two, two boxes of biscotti. So, so that's the way that we work here. So all these, there is no patents on this. You, you can't take money on this because people don't say, oh, you guys are in it for the money, you know, and making money out of misery. So, so we, we publish this stuff and nobody else. So there are various ways, and I'm not sure uh, how long I'm going to dwell on this. The, the obvious thing is that you, you push these, you know, through a very thin hole, and then you break it up. And, Somehow you dry it, and I did this some 30, 45 years ago, and this doesn't like a big deal, but actually it was a pretty big deal at that time. So you, you can make particles all exactly of the same size. And so then you make a sprayer with millions of holes, essentially, essentially. So the, the problem is that you know, making these very fine holes is no longer a problem. You can do that now with modern pattern techniques, but it's very difficult to keep them over. And you spray about 30 liters per second at a time. And so when that spray comes out, it's got to evaporate. That cools the air, and you can't lift these particles up. So, it's, so you want to minimize the amount of, so that's why you go from 30 liters to you know, half a glass of wine. So for right now, we have a bond. You know, people have been trying to do this for a long time. All the movie makers like to make cloths. And they told us, forget it. You're wasting your time. You're never going to do it. So then you go to electro spray methods. You know, that's how they, they coat your car. And so. We're, what you do is you don't make a capillary. You take sort of a point and you electrostatically you pull it out and it becomes a very thin, very thin jet. And you break that up and wow, look and lo and behold, 
these are particles all the same size. And what do you know? They're exactly the size that we would like to have. And this happens to be because the conductivity of seawater happens to be just right. If it was something different, it wouldn't work. So then you sort of have, well, the only problem is of each one of these little jets, you come at 10 to the 7 to the 8. So you got about 10 to the 8 of these little jets that you have to make, which is quite doable. But uh, it's quite an undertaking. And you take this, you know, so you, you get this, uh, make this polymerized resist, make holes in it. The blue stuff is water. And then you have this electrode about it. And you pull it through. And then you spray it in the air. And you make modules out of this. And it's sort of the way that HP you know, makes this inject. So same, same technology. So you know, it, it's doable. It, it requires a lot of money to get started for a simple prototype yeah, to do the research study. So then, you know, well, uh, well what are we going to do next? So you start supercritical seawater. And you know, that's probably something that most of you haven't heard about it. So you, you know, when you take water and you heat it, it becomes, um, and under pressure, it becomes like a very dense gas. So it's got about a third of the density of water. Okay. And it's got no surface tension, and it's got very low viscosity. So, you know, if it sprays like a gas, looks like a gas, it's got to spray like a gas, so very fine. Right? So that's what you do. And that's where you see this. So this, uh, this is, you heat it, and you spray it. And, you know, it's interesting. This, this plume is very blue. There's nothing blue light. This is the same reason that the sky is blue, scattering, you know, really scattering, as they call it. And then when you actually got to really fine, the plume almost disappeared because the particles are so fine. So this is our, our thing here. These two big boxes are actually just sort of make it look good. It's uh, make it complicated. It's actually, we don't use them, but they're there for decoration. So this is the right size and everything like that. Well, you know, when you come right down to it, this is really tough to do and too much power. So this is extraordinarily corrosive. Everything but diamond goes. Uh, anyway, that's end of story. So we then went to this technique, which we now are sort of pressing very hard. And this, this is called uh, effervescent amortization, which really is a big name for bubbly water. Okay. So what you do is uh, you actually feed water in on one side and air on the other, or air here and water there, and out comes essentially the spray. Now, the reason this works, for those that are so inclined to learn things, is that you normally, I don't know. I'm not sure how much. Uh, it's getting late here. So normally, you would di dissipate all the pressure over here in this orifice, right? Water comes out of the tube, the pressure is gone. But because of this mixture of air and water, you have what they call choked flow. And the flow can only go at the speed of sound in that medium. And so when you come out of here right there, you got a lot of pressure left over. And that explodes, essentially, that very fine micron stick layer of water that you have and gives you the very fine distribution. And so what happens is you start with a few bubbles. You add a few more bubbles. The bubbles get bigger. You come to what, you know, sort of that slug flow on the right-hand side. And eventually, you have all the water hanging on the, on the side. And you have the air in the middle. And you see this here. It explodes. And that's exactly what you want. And this is what you see over here. So this, this spray comes out, out of this very fine hole and really explodes very rapidly. And there's actually all kind of stuff going on and then proceeds from there. Well, it doesn't always work so fine. And as you can see here in the middle, because this mixing is chaotic, you're actually a full cylinder of water coming out. And then the guy that, whose brain doesn't work anymore, he says, he found a very nice solution to this, and which is actually uh, very interesting. So you know, uh, long story short, so this is what we have. And so we, we have this distribution here. Looks like a perfect normal distribution. This is exactly what you want. 80 nanometer median, essentially, what could go wrong, right? So the instrument is perfect. And so we always have this, you know, we're working at 84 bar, which is a little high. We bring it down to 12, you know, and it starts too good to be true. You know, and it's sort of like my financial stuff. When things look too good to be true, they normally aren't true. So what we then discovered is that, you know, there is a long tail over here that can be measured by this instrument. Now, measuring these particles there is not a big deal, but it's, you have to measure them at the same time. So right now, we're sort of in between. We don't know how effective this, what the efficiency is. Of course, I already had volunteered for this talk before we discovered this, and so it was too late to pull back. But anyway, so we think we're going to get there, but it's going to make a little bit more work. So, and so then you have to 
get these nuclei out there, right? So what you do is you use the same as you lose in snow cannons, right? So these are all these things. You got about a couple, 200 to 400 then, put a blower on it, and that throws them about 50 to 100 meter high. And that basically, once you're up there, convection will take over. So they tell me. So this is the snow blower. So this project has now been taken over by the, by the uh, University of Washington. And so there are two main things of this. Cloud studies and the formation of clouds are very important in the modeling of the thing. So we have, I don't know how many models we have, 20 or 25. And they all differ by the way that they treat the clouds because it's very, very difficult. So having a tool for making these clouds and studying them is very, very important. So that's the first thing. And the other thing is, you know, sort of a certain example of you know, good governance and all that kind of stuff to do these studies. Anyway, so this is our scientific team. The guy that lead that is Tom Ackerman. Uh, I don't know if you remember anything about nuclear winter, but uh, somewhere in 80, when was it, 84 or something like that, they discovered, you know, when we throw all these bombs to the Russians, we, we throw up so much stuff in the atmosphere that for four or five years, we virtually won't have any sunlight and probably go to famine. So that's nuclear winter. This is one of the lead authors on that particular paper. So Robert Wood is the other guy. And so this is our usual team of volunteers here. So we have a proposed experiment. We'll take five or 10 of these sprayers that you saw, you know, just that. And we'll put them on trucks and we move them around on land uh, because it's much cheaper to do these experiments on land. Of course, we do this very close to the ocean. And so that develops, you know, we can do different patterns, detect the patterns and see like that. So we now are sort of raising funds for this. Uh, I'll go around a little later in the evening, and we're raising trying to raise $6 million from various sources. And so once we know that this is successful, then we'd step out and do this at the ocean. So this is, uh, I don't want to dwell too long on that because we're going over our time here. So stage one and eventually stage three in the future would we'll do this on a, a 10 by 10 kilometer, on the square kilometer over the ocean. So the proposed landing would be, you know, is uh, moss landing, which is perfect. because We've got water everywhere around it. Right? So this is what it looks from the air. So, you know, it's perfect for marine clouds all the time there. You know, it's always foggy and thing, close to Mbari, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the possible applications are, it's a great tool for cloud studies, I already explained. So one interesting application is here along the coast of California. Right? Uh, we have lost about 35% of our fog during the summer. I, when I was a student, basically it was you know, cloudy until 11 o'clock and then sort of warmed up. That's gone. Since the 90s, that's gone. So we don't know whether it's global warming or not, but you can, these are well-known statistics. You can read this all. The airport is gone. So all our redwoods, coastal redwoods, are on a substantial strain because they, they don't have the fog cover that they have, no need the moisture. So that might be a very good application if you ever want to do this locally. This you can do locally. So you make this fog locally and see where it works. So the Arctic region is one that you want to cool. Unfortunately, there's much sunlight in the Arctic region, so that you know, works so well. So one interesting thing, and we, you know, this is a little far out, is that, for example, take Katrina. Right? You, you try to decrease locally maybe the hurricane intensity. So when Katrina came off the coast of Florida, it was a Category 3 hurricane. Right? Then it went over the Gulf of Mexico. It was 5 degrees warmer than usual and became a 5. So that's where all the energy comes from, this hurricane, is from the heating of this and the vapor pressure that you have there. So if you somehow would be able to reduce that, then you might you know, knock off one or one and a half of the, the, the intensity of these storms. So Ken has worked on sort of using this for control of El Nino, et cetera. So all of these are quite speculative, essentially, and eventually could use this worldwide. So you know, I just want to conclude with this sort of simple thing. This is from Carl Sagan, right? So this is a picture of the Earth, 6 billion miles away. So this is taken on the first Explorer one. And say and say when they passed uh, Neptune, flip the cameras around and take a picture. And that's what we did. So this is where we are. And as near as we can tell, and I don't know, we just analyzed, I don't know how many planets, and there is no sign of life. We're on our own. And you know we are v much more vulnerable than we ever thought. So you know the ozone layer, just to give you an example, right? That's Three millimeter, one eighth of an inch thick. If you take all the ozone that's up there and reduce it to the pressure that we have over here, it's three millimeter, one eighth of an inch thick. Fifteen centimeter, okay, fifteen centimeter of topsoil over ten percent of the earth. That's all we have between us and utter famine. You know, and so 
we, we are really very vulnerable, and messing with this climate you know, is a very, very dangerous thing. And so, you know, we're, we're basically, we're in, as Churchill said, you know, this, this area of doodling around is over. We're in the area of consequences. You know, the, area, the earth doesn't belong to us. You know, we have it on loan for our grandchildren. And leaving large, looming problems unsolved, okay, is unethical. So, you know, we have to sort of decide, will we going to write this out, that first class on the Titanic, we'll know what's coming, or do something about it. So our future isn't predetermined. It's what we decide today to make of it. So, you know, in geoengineering, it's the best is going to be a stopgap, and it may or may not help us, but we should definitely do the research. And so anyway, anyone that wants to join with us and work on this, uh, most welcome. Thank you.